Good afternoon, and welcome to the Master of Public Health Online Programs Faculty Spotlight Webinar with Dr. Claradina Soto, presented by the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. My name is Kiana Carter, and I am the Enrollment Advisor here for the Master of Public Health Online Program, and I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Before we begin, I'd like to review what you can expect during the presentation. To cut down on background noise, please mute your phone line so as not to disturb the presenters. If you have any questions for our speakers, please type them into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and hit send. Feel free to enter your questions as you think of them, and we'll answer as many as time allows at the end of the presentation. A copy of this recording and slide presentation will be available shortly after. Here's a quick look at what we'll be covering today. First, I will share some information about the Keck School of Medicine of USC. I'll give you some background information about our program director, Dr. Shuba Kumar, who will be available during the Q&A session for any questions. Then we'll hear from William Jardell, who will introduce our speaker, Dr. Claire Dina Soto. Lastly, we'll end the presentation with a brief Q&A session. Now, let's begin. About the Keck School of Medicine, Keck is the oldest medical school in Southern California. It was established in 1885. Today, it is a place of dynamic activity in patient care, scientific discovery, medical and bioscience education, and community service. The Department of Preventative Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine of USC is known as a leader in public health and population health sciences. It is organized into six divisions, disease prevention and global health, bioinformatics, biostatistics, cancer epidemiology and genetics, environmental health, and health behavior research. The Department of Preventive Medicine performs pioneering research in areas such as tobacco control, breast cancer, pediatric obesity, global health, interaction between genes and the environment and others. Some key research institutes include the Institute for Global Health and the Institute for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention Research. Now, Dr. Kumar is the program director for the Master of Public Health online program here at USC. She has a background in social return on investment analysis and has successfully led the design and oversight of several programs in healthcare, disaster relief, and education. Dr. Kumar has also launched an international humanitarian NGO for which she was the chief operating officer. Her recent projects include capacity building of healthcare, NGOs, and the development and strengthening of emergency medical systems in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I want to hand it off to William Jardell, who will introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. My name is William Jardell, and I'm the Director of Online Student Relations for MASA, or the Master of Public Health Student Association. In doing these webinars, it gives us, as students, a way to learn more about the amazing research our faculty is doing and ways in which we can learn more and get involved. I'm very excited to introduce to all of you Dr. Soto as our speaker for today. Dr. Clara Dina Soto is a full-time assistant clinical professor at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. She received her MPH and PhD from the USC Keck School of Medicine and she has over 20 years of experience working with American Indian and Alaska Native populations in public health. She collaborates on several research projects with various organizations to reduce and prevent mental health disparities, commercial tobacco use, and sub substance use disorders. She teaches courses in the Master of Public Health and Health Promotion programs at USC and mentors undergraduate and graduate students. Dr. Soto is a longtime advocate for American Indian and Alaska Native communities and other priority populations to advance health equity and reduce health disparities. I urge you to listen closely to the great information being presented today and to take notes on any questions you would like to ask at the end of the presentation. Will you please help me in welcoming Dr. Soto to the presentation?
Thank you. Can I now take the lead? <laughs> Yes, please. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to share with you about Native American culture and health. Uh, this presentation is really primarily to just give um, an awareness and um, some information about this population because oftentimes it's not um, enough information in our courses, um, even starting from elementary to high school to um, undergrad, unless of course you have selected some of these um, historical courses, right? So it really is a great opportunity to provide even just some of the um, additional, additional perspective you may not have had on this population, and so I get really excited to be able to share some of this with you. Um, I will share some of the projects at the end of just what's happening in hopes there might be some opportunity for um, students to be able to be engaged in, but this presentation is just more about the population, about um, some of the historical events, and giving an example about uh, a public health environmental justice issue that's happening at hand in the Navajo Nation. But I definitely will look forward to questions at the end of the presentation. So. Um, with that, I will just say that I am very fortunate to be here at USC and I'm very happy to be able to work with this population because it's very much an underserved and under-resourced um, community. Um, we'll see here in the next slide the number of populations that do exist. And so for myself, I am full-blooded um, Native American. I'm half Navajo and half Pueblo. And so um, I definitely learn so much in working and partnering and collaborating with a number of tribal communities um, with a lot of the projects we have here housed at USC. And so with that, I'll go to my next slide, which is just to really um, share how many um, there are of American Indians and Alaska Native populations in the U.S. And so according to the U.S. Census, there are about 5.2 million people who identify as such. There are over 570 plus federally recognized tribes in the United States. Um, I do always like to mention that there, of that, there are over 200 plus federally recognized tribes in Alaska, and I always call them the forgotten group because oftentimes people don't realize there are tribal communities up there, and let alone that there are over 200. Um, not to, and needless to say, I always mention not the only are they the forgotten group, but there are hard to some are hard to reach communities because they can be um, accessed by plane or only by boat or only by snowmobile. Of course, you can understand the environment that which some of these folks live in and so it's just an important to be able to recognize these communities up there and there's definitely a lot of great work being done as well. Um, just a note here that um, the Navajo Nation is one of the largest um, Indian reservations and that of these groups there are over 200 indigenous languages spoken and so it's important to know that there's a lot of um, culture, um, that there are a lot of unique differences, but a lot of similarities, but it's great to know that there's a lot of um, the cultural uh, preservations that exist in many of these communities. And I wanted to just note as well that you, you've already probably heard different terminology. I don't have the right answer. I often get asked, you know, what do, what, what is the best way to say Native American, American Indian, um, it just, it differs. Some I have learned in different communities I have gone to um, to use certain terms. Obviously, um, the most appropriate would be to be calling um, these communities by their tribe, by their tribal names that they prefer to be called by. And so, um, even to say the Navajo Nation, you know, the folks like to be called Diné, which means the people. So you have different um, terminologies, terminologies or different ways that the tribal communities like to be called, and so just wanted to make note of that as well. Much of my work is being done in California, and many often don't know that there are over 100, over 100 federally recognized tribes in the state of California, and so there's a lot of work to be done here, especially because you also have the urban Indian population. And you may want, you may question what is an urban Indian, and these are um, individuals who are of American Indian ancestry that relocate to um, an urban area, um, either by to seek employment, to get an education, or it could have also been by forced um, by forced relocation, primarily by uh, the U.S. government. And so I myself am a product. I always say of an, being an urban Indian, born and raised in the Bay Area, so Northern California, um, in San Leandro near Oakland. And so. Um, 
I am of an urban Indian, um, not of a California tribe, as I've mentioned, my tribes are from the Southwest, but this is really important in terms of when it comes to conducting um, research and trying to collaborate and partner um, with the urban Indian population, and so oftentimes that means going to different um, urban Indian agencies and organizations that exist um, throughout um, different areas in the Bay Area, here in LA, Downtown LA has the United American Indian Involvement, um, which services the urban Indian population um, with behavioral health services, mental health services, medical. Um, they have um, programs to work with the elders and with the youth, so there's some great comprehensive programs to reach these populations. My next slide here is just to show a map of some of the more common um, tribal communities that exist um, here in the United States. Um, and just by location. And I always like to note that in the U.S. there's only 35 states that have uh, tribes, and so this kind of can be in, an indicator in terms of the administration, you know, the U.S. government, and where folks may say that they don't need to have, um, to have this community on their radar and trying to create better services because they don't have tribal communities in their state. But that's not needless to say that there's a lot of great efforts that's still needed for various communities that do exist with the over 570 plus federally recognized tribes here in the U.S. Another question that always gets asked is, you know, how can one become a registered, you know, a member of a particular, you know, community here? And so this is always um, a big, this, this deserves, I think, you know, a whole session in itself, but I'll just take note here that it is, um, tribes do establish their own criteria um, for membership, as this really um, provides the unique character and traditions of each tribe, and so each tribe does um, are able to establish their own membership criteria. And so, um, typically, this could be more of um, the general piece here, where a tribe may say they have to show that they are a fourth tribal blood, um, a descendant of a tribal member. And so, usually, if you already have your parents or grandparents as an enrolled member to a tribe, um, it's pretty. Um, you just can indicate that and then the tribe will see that lineage for you to get your tribal membership. It is important to note though as well that you can only enroll in one tribe and so I myself being full-blooded, I can only enroll in either the Navajo side or the Pueblo side and so I actually am an enrolled member in the Navajo Nation but actually my children are enrolled in the Pueblo um, and those are for various reasons but in any event, um, these just gives you an idea of just kind of that process of what happens and how this membership is actually also important in terms of resources being made available to um, the American Indian community. The other important piece that's important to make um, students aware of and even just the general population is about tribal sovereignty. Because with federal recognition, um, American Indian tribes can self-govern themselves as sovereign nations, and so they're maintaining their own government-to-government -to -government relationship with the United States. And so I like to try and see it as how California is its own state, but each tribe is kind of its own state as well, because they are able to govern and um, govern their own tribal members, their own tribal land, and provide their own infrastructure for their own community. But we do have to abide by federal laws in many ways, just as other um, U.S. states have to do that same thing. But um, this part is very important, especially in just the work that I do with some of our research projects because we want to be able to um, respect the tribal sovereignty of these communities. And so this comes into, um, this is a very important um, piece because when it comes to um, laws and policies, so some of my work is in tobacco control and California has done an excellent job in trying to reduce tobacco um, commercial tobacco use in the general population, which has reduced, but that has not been the case for our populations here, the Native American population, because there's a lot of um, work to still be done. And so um, so the communities here, um, the tribes don't have to abide by state laws, um, meaning that they don't. So a lot of the casinos here in California, they allow smoking, and they rightfully should have that right to do so, because they have the right and their government and their laws to be able to do that. And so that does take extra effort for us to make sure that they understand, you know, the education and the implications on some of these policies here. Um, but we have to respect that. That's their, their laws that they govern by. 
But the other piece that is important is that any work that's being done is you have to have the tribe be a part of that process because they too have to be in collaboration and in partnership in any work trying to, especially when it comes to public health and health promotion. And so I oftentimes have to um, start with the tribal leaders and get tribal approval for any work that's being done in collaboration so that they know that that partnership is happening. Um, so this is just a really important piece to be able to highlight here, um, especially when trying to work with various tribal communities um, just throughout the United States. Okay. So with that, I'd just like to highlight again when working with tribal communities that you want to be able to respect the sovereignty, develop a relationship that is so important because you want to be able to nurture that. And so oftentimes when we have these grants and different projects, um, these, pro these grants, we need a long-term um, grant mechanism because it takes a while. If you don't have an established relationship, it could take three to five years and maybe even more just to develop a trusting relationship and working with tribal communities. And so for that to happen, then you can next be able to work on some of the needs and what are some of the areas of concern that the community wants to be able to work with and with your project. So including them in the process is absolutely key to any type of work. And so many of you probably have learned this in your courses already with community-based participatory research. And so that means um, the tribe, the community is being a part of that process because we just don't want to be able to take, we want to be able to um, have that mutual relationship with both academic and with the community as well. So with that, being that a lot of our work here is in public health and there's a lot of um, unfortunate health disparities that exist in this community, I'd like to just kind of give a brief history of this and really get us in the mindset of just how to be mindful of some of the traumatic events that have occurred since the time of the so-called, you know, Columbus had discovered America, but, you know, in the thousands of years preceding European contact, much of our Native communities were organized in societies with their own forms of government and their own way of life, right? But once you see these events of just kind of these historical topics here that have happened from 1492 up until the present day, there's a lot of things that have occurred during that history time that really has an impact and can um, show some of those correlations into some of the unfortunate um, health disparities that exist in, in this community. And so with that colonial period, you know, we had this proliferation of European colonies really cre creating a dominant presence, you know, on the east coast of North America, right? So a lot of the Indian lands were forcefully acquired by the Europeans, which led into the removal of a lot of tribes and forced migrations to, of these tribes to move west. I mean, this even came to a point where at least 90 million acres of, of uh, land that are the natives um, were living on were taken from tribes and given to settlers as a surplus, most often without compensations to the tribe, unfortunately. So during this time, there was a lot of removal and a lot of now putting these communities once living in their way of life onto these reservations now. And so not only have you removed them, but you placed them on these lands that they now have to be able to adapt in a new environment, new culture, way of life, new sources of food and other things. And, not to, and this of course, is a very resilient community, but you have to think about some of those things that they now have had to adapt to, and currently still to to this day, living um, with some of those folks being on on the reservation. And so you had um, all of that during that period, and the big piece of this is really this assimilation that happened with the U.S. government trying to assimilate um, the Native communities into mainstream society, really trying to not only remove them from their land, but remove them from their cultural way of life. And that in itself, you know, really has an impact. And so there's a lot of things that have happened within that history to be able to do that. But needless to say, um, in the 1930s, you know, we did have some sort of, you know, this kind of um, Indian reorganization to be able to give back and um, where the federal government began to restore some of this Indian land and creating programs to rehabilitate and the, and the economic life for this community. But Needless to say, what happened after that was this unfortunate termination period where the government, the, U, the Congress decided to um, terminate at least 100 tribes, um, really creating an economic disaster for many tribal communities, um, again, resulting in millions of acres of land being lost and, of course, the way of life for, for many of these communities. 
Um, but as of now, you know, so you have to think of that time. That's just not too far ago, you know, from the 50s and 60s. And then now we have here the self-determination period, which is absolutely happening, you know, with our communities, being able to um, uh, have this kind of resurgence of tribal government involvement with Congress to be able to not to have any additional terminations, but to really um, provide that state recognition and federal recognitions to, to those tribes and develop more policies for self-determination and self-governance as well. So this I'd just like to um, kind of point out as it's um, important to be mindful as this does have an impact on how this creates um, some of the public health issues in this community. And so with that, I wanted to kind of share a little bit more about um, some examples of this assimilation and how this happened. And so um, they had, um, back in the day, Richard, uh, General Richard Pratt, which had, he's famous for his quote of, kill the Indian and save the man. And when you think about this quote, this is trying to um, take away the language, the culture, the way of dress, um, but to Americanize them, basically. And so you can see this picture here of this um, Navajo gentleman in his um, traditional wear, but three years later, he is now um, transformed into this um, kind of militant looking in individual. And this really had was based on folks being part of this boarding school, which the government also had this part of their systematic way of assimilating um, Native children in, in the school system of, of assimilating them into mainstream society, right? So just another systematic way of the government. And so this picture here is of the Carlisle Indian Boarding School um, that happened in the late 1880s to early 1990s. And again, these boarding schools were developed to assimilate American Indians. And so this school is very well known in um, Pennsylvania, which um, this became the model for at least another 26 boarding schools in 15 states, and also hundreds um, of private boarding schools sponsored by various religious denominations. And so actually both my parents are products of boarding schools. Um, my, my mother being taken away from her family at a very young age, I want to say six, seven years of age, um, and living in a boarding school being raised by um, non-natives and not being able, able to speak her language, her mouth being washed out with soap if she was not, if she was to speak her language when she's trying to speak to a peer of hers, which none of them knew English at the time, right, but that was something that they were mandated to do. And if they um, broke any type of rules or laws of that and within this boarding school, um, they were reprimanded. So there was a lot of physical abuse, um, uh, verbal abuse, and even sexual abuse that happened in these boarding schools. And so, again, this is just another indication of some of this assimilation practices that occurred by the government that really has a major impact on this community, um, longstanding for sure. Um, again, even me having my own parents being part of this system, a product of this system. And so you can see that this is a, this new terminology that, that's not new, but um, more of this is coming into the research of this um, historical trauma, which really is just um, showing the experience of the series of traumatic events by the U.S. government and how this has um, implications to um, to our community in many ways because of this listing that you see here of all these different acts that have happened. So this does now reflect, you know, in our communities the higher than average rates of suicide, homicide, domestic violence, child abuse, substance abuse, um, and really because of these attempts to assimilate our communities and our populations by forcing them into these um, boarding schools, but then also thinking of these others of putting them into um, reservations now, which then they have changed their diet, their culture, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so with that, you see a lot of these. And so within the research, there are questions now that we have to indicate if folks think about these historical traumatic events, and what are some of these symptoms that are now occurring, and you really see a lot of these breakdown in our families because of this forced removal of our children or because of these other historical events that have happened and um, are um, reasons for high rates of child abuse now. And you have to think if these folks that were taken into these boarding schools or raised in these boarding schools, you know, they their parenting style can definitely be different, and there's a lot of um, even just um, 
a lot of healing that needs to happen because of the abuse and other traumatic things that have happened while being in there. And so um, there's a lot of higher rates now of domestic violence, and I think there's just a lot of anger issues that are still happening that need to be dealt with, and a lot of healing, as mentioned, that needs to happen in this community. And then we also have just a lot of psychological um, issues happening that are really impacting a person's well-being. You know, unfortunately, higher alcohol consumption, substance abuse, unfortunately, having low self-esteem, you know, this being because of cultural identity, um, having a lack of positive role models, uh, role models, excuse me, um, but then also these other physiological things that are happening as we do have higher rates of heart disease, um, um, injuries with diabetes, um, and other issues, can, which I think are on my Yeah, so in terms of just the health status as well, um, again, being that there's just, um, there's many causes of health disparities that really span the life spectrum within this community with high infant mortality rates, um, high prevalence of chronic diseases, mental health disorders, and substance abuse. Um, but I do give, um, but there is a lot of resilience that has happened in this community and culture has definitely been one way to not only heal but also a way to promote the well-being in, in the community. But here, when we compare the American Indian Alaska Native population, um, comparing them to the overall U.S., um, they are younger, poorer, and more likely to be unemployed or lack health insurance. Again, suffer from high rates of a number of um, health health-related um, illnesses, and then also to have a lower life expectancy um, than the general um, U.S. population. So, with that, there are a number of health risks, of course, um, based on this. You know, and, and there's a lot of um, issues that are um, related and complicate things. Um, these are just a number of um, public health issues that need to be addressed. And so here, um, with some of my work, um, it's dealing with um, trying to reduce mental health, reduce substance use, um, tobacco use, and some environmental issues as well in this community. But this definitely deserves a lot more attention. And oftentimes, I do ask that if you are sitting in a table, and there, there always has to have that need the representation needs to happen to bring the, this community um, uh, their issues to the table. So um, even if as you're just learning some of this and you are in a meeting, maybe your job is in a county or you know in some agency and there's things happening for other communities, you know, I do ask that you you know pose the question of how are how how is this how are they reaching this community and how are some of the issues being addressed? Um, especially if it may relate to some of these topics here that you see on this slide. So, um, so that's just kind of that little um, piece of the that health promotion. Those things to keep in mind when you think about how, um, why are the, why why are there a lot of health um, issues and health disparities in this community um, when there's a lot of things that have happened, you know, through through history that absolutely have an impact on this. And so, this deserves a lot of of additional attention, a lot of additional work to be done, and a lot of um, collaboration and partnership with these communities to be able to address um, the various needs um, within these communities. And so um, I'll leave it at that because my next slides are to um, also um, provide an example of just kind of this public health issues of high rates of cancer, um, high rates of other illnesses. Um, due to um, uranium mining. So I'll go ahead and go to this next slide here. Um, this is something that I was able to do over 20 years ago, and it's um, that sounds so long ago, but this is still an issue currently on the Navajo, Navajo Nation where the community is dealing with a lot of high rates of cancer and high rates of um, black lung disease, um, other illnesses due to radiation exposure, and these aren't just folks that worked in the mines, but their families and families that live around abandoned waste sites, abandoned um, waste that sits on the reservation. And so it's always great to just increase your awareness about current issues that are happening just here in our own backyard in the United States. And so this map here just shows um, where the Navajo Nation sits in the southwest, most of um, uh, parts of Arizona, parts of New Mexico and Utah. And so my family's from Farmington, New Mexico, right near the Four Corners, and I had an opportunity to do an internship in my undergrad years. So um, it was 
um, familiar territory, but living there was another interesting aspect in trying to just understand um, this issue at hand because we were trying to increase the awareness of the community that um, we needed to get Congress to take action to not only help those that were sick, but to also remove a lot of the waste that was sitting in the community. But this picture here just shows of um, some documentaries that have been done um, about this issue. And so this is a picture of just Navajo miners to give you an idea of just their um, work environments because they, um, many of these miners were working in for $2 a day and not having much um, fresh air where those that were working in the mines had no proper um, ventilation. And so they were being exposed to this um, radioactive material um, daily. And so, um, but little did they know what they were being exposed to. They had no idea at that time. Um, but the, the companies did, obviously. Um, so this is just um, showing how um, uranium is a naturally occurring radioactive element. And so many Navajo men worked in these mines and these mills. Um, jobs were near their home and was one of the only jobs available at the time, and which was during the uh, 40s and 50s. Um, there was many jobs that included um, different positions, um, again, but no protective equipment was um, provided. Um, and so they inhaled a lot of the dust and drank contaminated waters near these mines. This picture here also indicates how the environment has been contaminated because a lot of the excess waste that they didn't need, they would just shuffle it over the cliff sides. And so that gets into the farmlands, it gets into their um, to the animals that graze. And so sheep is a, a staple in this community where um, many families, when I would go home to visit grandma, she would butcher a sheep and we would have a, a wonderful family feast. But these animals are, are um, ingesting um, contaminated um, things within the environment. And again, and it's getting into a lot of the farming, uh, the communities that um, farm as well. The picture on the bottom indicates a lot of the abandoned sites that still sit in the community. EPA has done some work, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, where some places have been considered more hazard than others, but there's still a lot of abandoned sites that have not been touched because they don't quite meet that criteria. Um, but needless to say, there's a lot of exp exposure still happening in this community. Um, especially for those um, with this picture here shows an abandoned mine, so you see how vastly open this is. And this is from some of the work that I did um, over 20 years ago, and I was very thankful to these folks because they told me to stay away if I wanted to have children, um, to stay away from these abandoned sites because we, they, the question was how, how much exposure do you need um, is, um, could get you sick. And so um, I definitely kept my distance, but there is a lot of children that were playing in these mines not knowing or in um, piles of the meal tellings. And oftentimes some of the families were taking these chunks of the ore or the leftover sites to um, build their bread ovens or even have as their own home foundations or build fireplaces, um, not knowing that they were being exposed to radioactive elements on a daily basis. And so this picture here, if you could see kind of that there's a dark mountain in the back, but the lighter one in front of that is the actual meal tellings um, waste that sits in the middle of the reservation near Tuba City. And so this is um, covered with cement, but needless to say, once this has been dug up and put out, there's um, still that exposure can exist. So no matter how thick that, that cement is, um, that exposure is still radiating out into the community with the beta, gamma, alpha rays, I don't know which one of those, but you get my point. I'm sorry I'm not the scientist here on this piece, but this just kind of gives you an idea of this, how long and how much of this waste sits in this community and still being exposed where they picked up and collected some of it, but again, it still sits um, in a community exposing a particular community there. And the, the part about this is that, you know, you have um, over time this um, um, seepage that's this is now getting into the groundwater. And so there's a lot of research actually being done by the University of New Mexico, which I'm really thankful for. And they're really identifying a lot of contaminated areas and sites. And, um, and really, I think this is also helpful to ensure that uh, future mining is not going to happen because there's still a lot of high, rich deposits of uranium that sits on the Navajo Nation that the government wants their hands on. And we want to make sure that um, the Navajo Nation government 
um, again, who is a sovereign entity, and they can make that decision to say, yes, we'll allow you, but being more informed and knowing how much harm this has caused this community and the environment that hopefully it will keep the, um, the additional mining from happening in this community. And so, again, there's just a lot of diseases now that are happening in this community with higher rates of uh, lung cancer, um, 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 all because of these exposure to byproducts, you know, again, in the soil, air, and water. This is um, something that has been happening in, in terms of the knowledge of knowing that correlation of being exposed to radiation and the outcomes of cancer and other um, um, illnesses that that are because of this exposure. And so this really has um, really created um, an unfortunate piece for the community. And so um, real quickly, just what's happening now is that the community has really fought hard in the past 20 years with some good leadership, taking it back to Congress to at least get compensation. So those miners, former miners, um, their family, their wives, the children, are able to apply for compensation of up to $150,000, which some folks say is such an insult because this barely pays for their medical bills. And so um, it's really a challenge to get that money because you have to um, you have to um, approve, show documentation that you worked with one of these companies or that you were married to a minor. Um, to out, to be able to um, help pay off those medical bills. There's just a lot of loops and barriers to this, and it's a bit, very big challenge, but there's people that are helping people get compensated, um, but there's a lot of appeals that have to happen because you get rejected the first time, and then you have to continue to reapply. But it is reaching some, but it has missed a lot because there's been a lot of losses due to this, and a lot of the, because of the illnesses and um, deaths related to the cancer from being exposed to all of these deadly materials. And so um, that's just something at hand that's happening in this community that, again, wanted to raise your awareness about this because um, many of us have no idea that this is happening and it's still being fought till to this day and folks trying to remove this contaminated stuff in their, in their community but also help those that are sick. Shifting gears a little bit, I'd just like to share this other story because this is kind of the part of the resilience that still happens to this day, and this is the story of culture. It is a quick story, but um, this is um, the Pueblo Revolt that happened um, in 1680, and so again, this, not, this is not included in our history books, and it absolutely should because this is where um, the Pueblos in New Mexico revolted against the Spaniards who were trying to acquire land. And so this picture here shows the different um, pueblos in this in New Mexico, and um, Jemez is mine, which is J-E-M-E-Z, right above Zia Pueblo. But all of these um, pueblos were organized by a leader, a Taos Pueblo leader named Pope. And so he's the one that is um, well known for organizing a rebellion against the, the, the Spaniards. And so you see a picture, a statue here that they have up in New Mexico, and in his hand he has um, a rope of knots. And so he um, had every Pueblo, he made sure that every Pueblo got this um, rope of, of knots because he had said that every morning that the sun comes up to remove a knot. And when, that, when we get to that last knot on that day is when we're going to revolt against the Spaniards. And so that was a way of them reuniting, getting together, and organizing against themselves, which they, of course, had a great victory um, against the Spaniards, which is great. So a victory for the Pueblos, I should say, is why um, a story of how they still exist today. This next picture is just because I love to share a little bit about Jemez Pueblo, and so that is a picture of uh, myself my father, and my two children. I do need to update this because my son now dances as well. So my daughter and I are both dressed in our regalia for our traditional um, feast day. It is open to the public. It's always on August 2nd. Um, and so we dance, um, and it's a time for our community to come together and for prayer, for growth, for well-being. And so um, there's a lot of preparation that happens for this feast day, which one is um, baking bread, because that's our main um, tool, or I guess our, our um, instead of using a fork and spoon, you know, our bread is used to dip in the red chili stew and the green chili stew. And so this is our oven here that um, is a fire that's made. And once that's out, we remove all the ashes and put all the 70 plus uh, loaves of bread in there, cover it up, and bread is nice and done in an hour. 
But you see here just um, my children riding their bikes out in the dirt areas, which is just great for the kids to roam because here living in the city, it's a little bit more difficult and letting them allow to just roam around free. So I love showing this picture and just sharing a little bit about um, the Hamas culture because I often do ask students, you know, what do you picture when you're thinking of Native communities? And so um, it's great to just share even just the regalia of our, our community here. Um, I have a few more minutes, but this here is just a little a slide just showing some of these common values among uh, Native um, Native communities, and it's about sharing generosity. You know, no matter how much has happened in this community and, or in the communities, I should say, there's oftentimes just a lot of sharing and generosity, and oftentimes it's great going to different um, conferences that are Native specific because there's just a lot of um, sharing and a lot of generosity and just being thankful for, for the things given. Uh, family is very important, community and tribes, and I always keep that in mind, especially with all the work that we have done because everything we do, and at least with our projects, is for um, the community and for these families and, and um, the tribes. And having respect for elders is, op is uh, I, I'm sure this is very much a common value for many folks um, in different communities, um, but we often want to make sure that we respect our elders and go to them for guidance and making sure that we are doing things in the most respectful way. And again, orientation to present time, you know, it's great that um, us here in modern day life, we're always worried about time and this and that, but it's always... Um, orientation to present time is just in the moment. And so if I have a 2 o'clock appointment but I'm meeting with the community, um, we could be talking for another two hours and you just got to be in that present moment and at that present time and be responsible for that um, for this community. The other piece is interesting is communication. And I wish I had more time because I have so much that I have learned with communication um, with this community in terms of trying to introduce myself and getting part, being a part of different projects and collaborating and partnering. Um, but it is absolutely important to have face time to be able to introduce yourself to the community because a phone call is just not going to work. Um, you definitely want to be able to always um, um, these are very general, of course, I want to say that, you know, but speak slowly and pause while telling a story because I, overall with this communication I've learned that not all communities but some um, is that, that direct eye contact is important where they don't necessarily look, it's sometimes that the contact, the eye contact is um, looking somewhere else and people can think of it as being rude. And so when I train others to go and help out in the community when we're trying to gather information, I oftentimes um, will let them know that it's not, you know, it don't, um, if they're not looking at you, don't take it as being rude. That's just how it is. But they are, it's a, they're still listening um, uh, those and, and still paying attention to things. But these are just some of those things that I like to um, bring up, but it doesn't mean that it's for everybody. But these are things that I have absolutely learned along the way as well. And that, of course, they don't. There's a lot of distrust of outsiders, and so again, that's part of building that relationship with these communities as well. The other that I like to um, provide is just again with your with your work being in health promotion. Um, there's um, health promotion messages, um, as this is just an example of how. Um, trying to reach a specific community with a specific message that absolutely resonates for this community. And so being in tobacco control and all of this great anti-tobacco messaging that has happened out um, for the general population, we have to be careful because some of that doesn't quite resonate with us where you're telling our communities, our Native communities, that all tobacco is bad. Well, it's not because tobacco is very sacred to us and it's used in traditional, ceremonial, and medicinal ways. And so how do we give back to give that message to show that we must preserve that sacred part, the sacred tobacco, but also knowing that if using tobacco in an abusive way, using recreationally, that this can be harmful to your health, and that's not, we definitely want to um, provide that message as well. So um, back in my work, um, this was made over 10 years ago, but it's great that we'll still see this poster in um, various clinics and other um, Native agencies throughout California. This was put together where we were only allowed to provide, to create one, um, one health promotion message. And how difficult was that, knowing that we have a beautifully diverse 
um, communities throughout the state of California. So how are we going to try and reach all? And so we did it to the best of our ability, which then we had to ensure that we were using peripheral strategies, matching the surface characteristics, meaning the community that you're trying to reach, right? And absolutely having the number four constituent involving strategies where you're involving the community, you're involving those that can provide that guidance. And so this really had, with that guidance, they said, let's create, let's try and create something with the four directions in mind, the north, south, east, and west. And so with that in mind, um, the, the, the woman is reflective of the northern California tribes, um, Yurok, Basket is representative of how Southern California tribes um, uh, weave their baskets. And for the um, east and west are the tobacco plants that grow um, to the east and to the west side. And so then you have the messaging that has to be clear, right? I can't quite read it from here, but hopefully you guys are able to with that message that is supposed to resonate with um, this community where um, it's saying, you know, that the Creator gave us tobacco. Um, to bless our families and our community, right? But if you smoke um, commercial tobacco and abuse it, um, you know, that's it's, it's going to create harm. So we want to keep tobacco as a gift and not to be abused. And so I just wanted to provide that example of how you use some of those strategies in trying to create public health messaging for, um, for this community. So with that, um, that ends um, some of the stuff that I wanted to share with you all, but I also wanted to just share some of the funded grants I currently have and um, hoping that if you have an interest in working with some of the um, projects that I have going on currently, we are looking for students to help with um, data entry, maybe literature reviews, and so folks knowing that many of you are online students and may not necessarily be here, so some may be able to come to the office, but others uh, might be able to work remotely. Um, we are searching for folks, for students, for some student help. It could either be volunteer or it could also be for credit, and I forget what those class credits are, but other folks on the line um, from the MPH program can share with that. But we do have um, a couple of tobacco-related um, programs for smoking cessation, um, trying to help uh, Native teens um, quit smoking or quit using many of these other nicotine products such as e-cigarettes and the vaping things like that, but then we also have a social media project where we're training um, Native youth um, to develop their own media messages with digital storytelling, photo voice, public service announcements, and they are being peer, edu peer educators back to the Native youth, but also then to tribal councils to create um, tobacco policy changes. And then we have another that's looking at community readiness in tribal communities throughout the state of California where we're trying to understand if um, tribes are um, adopting state policies or state laws. So, for example, California just passed um, a law of being the, having to be the age of 21 to purchase. So, are tribes um, uh, also ad um, adopting that law? If they are, we're, we're asking why. If they are not and choose not to, we're asking why not just to kind of learn a little bit more about some of the different policies that are in tribal communities as it relates to tobacco control. And this last one is um, really addressing the opioid crisis. Um, Native, Native Americans have some of the highest um, opioid use, but also opioid-related deaths. And this is a really serious issue happening at hand. And so there's a lot of funding being made available to some of the tribal communities here and urban Indian populations in California. So um, us here at USC are tasked with the needs assessment to learn more how this funding can be helpful to um, create um, treatment services, prevention, and other services to um, culturally reach these communities, but also evaluation with a lot of these projects that are being funded um, and making sure of showing how this is creating an impact to reduce um, opioid use and opioid-related deaths. So um, with that, I want to say thank you. And I know I went a little bit over time, but um, looking forward to uh, some of your questions. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, and that's all right you went over a little bit. That was a lot of great information that you shared with us today, and we are so grateful uh, for you uh, being with us on this webinar. I'm sure we do have plenty of questions, uh, so we are going to 
open up the Q&A session. I do want to remind students that our program director, Dr. Kumar, is also um, on the line available for uh, questions as well. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start off the Q&A session actually looking back at uh, you know, some of the research opportunities that you have available right now, and you were talking about some of the roles that you're trying to fill. What steps do students take uh, to participate uh, in any of your research opportunities? What would they need to do to participate? Yeah, so with my information up there, it would just be great to just send an email. And so um, sending an email, it would be great for this to start in spring just to make it easier that way. So again, it could be volunteer or it could be um, for, for credit. And then um, we can just touch base. Um, and usually I'll ask for um, a CV and just a, a statement of interest. And then um, we can take it from there to see how we might make this an opportunity. So just emailing me, and then um, I'll probably follow up in um, November or December, and then um, try and figure figure out how um, we can best get the help for a number of these projects. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing that information. Um, our next question is uh, is for you, Dr. Soto. Uh, do tribes have their version of public health departments internally that work with federal and nonprofit public health workers? Yes. They do. Um, the tribes have their own um, departments, and not all, but some. And so, some infrastructures are stronger um, than others. And so, um, these and actually, these are some of the entities that we have to go through. And so, like even with our research projects, where we have our own um, academic um, IRB, ensuring that we are not putting any human subjects at risk, we have to get that certification and approval. Well, some of the tribes also have their own departments as such, where we have to go through their um, protocol and um, IRB process as well, ensuring that we're not putting anybody at risk as well. So yes, they do. And then some um, either internally fund themselves or they get the support of um, uh, government support or that federal funding support their departments. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question uh, is, as a student, are there grants or scholarships available for this very important research? Yes, there is. Um, I actually ask you all if, if, the, if there are opportunities. I guess I can share that for the MPH to share with the, list, with the MPH listserv. That might be helpful. I mean, okay. and so this could be both ways where students may want to um, work in this capacity or they may want to get the funding. So. Um, this could be um, either for Native students themselves wanting that additional research experience or those that are non-Native but then um, just wanting to see what other opportunities are, um, they have that available. But um, things that I have, I can definitely share your way too if that's helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is, uh, for healthcare workers, is it hard or not an option to conduct studies from afar since in-person interaction seems to be of great importance? So meaning um, for public health workers working in tribal communities? Am I understanding that correctly? I am going to assume that that. Yes, for public, so, um, for public health workers, yes. Um, yeah, you did. Um, <laughs> it's, it's important to absolutely have that um, interaction, um, in-person interaction. That is absolutely of great importance to ensure um, that trust and that mutual respect and that um, continuance of mutual relationships and building and ensuring that you're trying to meet the needs of a community. So, uh -huh. yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, our next question, uh, actually, is are there popular blogs that I can follow from either yourself or others concerning awareness on uh, sexual abuse, uranium, and other topics that impact Native American culture? There's a number of them out there, and I think the one I'll mention is um, Indian Country. So you can actually get um, a subscription to Indian Country. It's very inexpensive, and it really provides current event issues. I think it comes out weekly. I could be wrong, but it it's, um, comes out often, and there's a lot of different current events um, that um, shares information about various communities throughout the U.S. Okay. 
Thank you for sharing that information. Uh, our next question uh, actually is a three-part question. Uh, so, mm -hmm. have you have uh, how has different eras of government been with working with Native Americans? Um, is it worse now than it has been in the past, or was there a time it was best as far as the relationship with the federal government? Mm. Great question. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question because, um, yeah, oftentimes, even just when you think of presidents, um, and former administrations, our current administration, I mean, that's the part that I'm thinking about, right, and and how these governments have been or not working with um, Native, Native Americans. Um, this really um, has changed. So, I mean, I even think of just currently, you know, with our former President Obama and really putting a lot of um, first, or how, how am I saying this? Um, there's been a lot of positions having a first time Native American in that position and that happened a lot with President Obama because he really believed in trying to um, support um, this community um, who again, as mentioned, very underserved, very under-resourced and so really working even with youth and having this great, um, gosh, I want to say it was called Generation X, and I could be wrong, but he, and, some of, and it was great that some of my family was part of this, where there was just um, thousands of Native youth that were put together to meet with President Obama and Michelle Obama at that time, and, and things progressed from there because students were able to share the needs of their community and the things that they would want you know, to be successful individuals um, in, in not only their own communities, but just in in, um, in 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 our own and just here today to be successful um, contributing individuals to society is what I'm trying to say. Um, so it has changed constantly. I mean, just that quick little um, his history of events of where you know things were trying to go good and then all of a sudden you terminate a hundred tribes. Um, that again is based on the types of tribal or the um, types of government or who was in government and at that time. Um, so that definitely is scary of where we are currently and how that is uh, potentially, you know, making more harm than good to these communities. And so, you know, one example is um, funding. There's a lot of funding that has been taken in a way that really um, preserves not only the cultural way of life, but education, um, opportunity for youth, but then also for other segments of the population. And so we're seeing a lot of that unfortunate um, things happening because of our current administration. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, I'm trying to think of current, past, and um, how that works with our relationship with the federal government. I mean, there's a lot that I've learned even in our own work here because I think of um, a huge grant that we got here to learn about the retail environment on tribal lands and trying to learn about um, uh, tribal, tribally manufactured tobacco products. So, you know, tribes are making their own um, tobacco products um, for their own economic um, infrastructure, right? And so, anyways, we had some of that work being done to learn more about the retail environment to learn. And we learned that our own community is not using these products, and which is a good thing. Um, but we had this federal funding from FDA and from the National Institute of Health and so when our communities were learning that we had this funding from the federal government, they definitely did not want, many of them were reluctant in working with us because now that's with the federal government who was trying to um, put a lot of these retail retailers, um, trying to make sure that they were in compliance with the federal rules, meaning that they should not be selling to minors, which means that they should not be having a vending machine of cigarettes, which means they should not be selling Lucy's. And so part of our work was to um, uh, and to educate tribes of, of this happening because, again, you know, they have to abide by federal laws, so then the tribes were worried that federal governments were going to come into their community and make them do certain things. But um, And so you've had some tribes that have had their own tribal police um, shoo away federal um, 
federal folks that have come onto um, their own tribal land. So it gets really tricky. Um, it gets really, um, the, that relationship is definitely um, not a trusted one, as you can see just with this example I gave. But there's just a lot of different things that happen and occur that, um, again, that's why it's important to understand a little bit about tribal sovereignty and then what does that mean with that federal government relationship. But I'll leave it at that. I could go on and on about that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, our next question is, what are your thoughts on current efforts regarding opioids in Native communities? Yes. Well, so I only know of this current event. So I'm really happy that a lot of funding is coming out from SAMHSA to address the opioid crisis in Native communities and populations. And so um, I'm hoping that folks, our tribes and communities are applying for those for those funds to be able to address it in their own communities. Um, I'm really happy with the state here in California. I've worked with a number of state departments before, and so this Department of Healthcare Services has to be one of the most progressive in the sense that they're providing funds to Indian country here in California, to tribal communities, the urban Indian populations to address this, and being um, um, allowing them to have these funds to um, provide services, so medication-assisted treatment services, these MAT programs that they have that they are trying to address um, how to best promote um, uh, training others um, with naloxone because many folks have overdoses and so how can we try to, pre um, to reverse that, right? So by providing naloxone to folks that have overdosed, we can save a life. So they're doing a lot of training with that and they're doing a lot of with suicide prevention as well. So. Um, the funding is great, and I hope that tribal communities are applying for this because I know just here in California it's a big issue, and I know it's a big issue in other um, in other states as well um, that have the population that are uh, dealing with this issue right now. So um, uh, um, that that I know in itself, and there's a lot of work to be done in figuring out what's what's the best way to reach these communities and in, in the most appropriate and most cultural um, way in meeting their needs. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. We're a little short on time, so I'm going to ask one more question for you, Dr. Soto. Um, it's actually another three-part question. Uh, but what online courses do you teach? Uh, do you mm -hmm. teach about this topic in your online course, and what other topics do you cover? So online course, I used to teach the, P, the PM501, right, the theory course. Um, but it's been a while because with all of this great funding that we have, less time to teach. Um, so more, I just do more guest lectures um, in terms of just trying to address certain topics like these. Um, so yeah, so I mean, we um, are trying to, I'd love to have our own class you know, that's related to this topic in the Masters in Public Health. Um, but I also know that I'm working with the School of Social Work, and so we have a course there. So I don't know if anybody um, is a dual degree with the MPH and MSW, but we have um, an immersion program that takes graduate students to the Cheyenne River Sioux Indian Reservation and um, giving them the opportunity to uh, make an impact in this population. So. Um, so that's where a lot of other topics are definitely addressed and you get a whole semester of um, different issues um, regarding um, and how to best reach these communities um, in public health efforts. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Soto, for sharing uh, with us today. Um, I definitely want to thank our speaker, Dr. Soto, uh, Dr. Kumar, who was also on the line, uh, as well as William Jardale. And I want to thank everyone who participated in today's webinar. I do want to let you know a copy of this recording and slide presentation will be available shortly after. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Great. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.